I'm Laren, this is Knife Still Nerds, so we're doing something a little bit different today because we're not talking about a specific study, but rather a person who has done a bunch of studies. That person is knife maker Juha Pertula. So he is in Finland, and he makes a lot of pukos, as you might imagine being in Finland. But the more interesting thing about Juha, uh, more than his uh, dashing good looks or his knife making, is that he has a doctorate in metallurgy, and he has published several studies on knife steel. And he very recently came out with a study published in a journal on heat treating of ADCRV2 with simple methods. I thought the paper was very interesting. I was thinking about doing a video or an article or something about it, but, you know, you get a little worried, like sometimes if you have some criticism of a study or even if you say mostly positive things, sometimes they get a little upset. But then Juha emailed me and he's like, hey, did you see my new article? And I said, yeah, I wanted to talk about it, actually. And he was on board with that. So we talked about his studies a little bit and we're going to discuss them here in this video. A couple of his earliest studies published in 2001 and 2004 were about Wootz. Now, Wootz, of course, is the legendary Damascus material. Unlike pattern-welded Damascus, which is two or more different materials laminated together, Wootz is a single steel that is processed in a specific way so that you still get a macroscopic pattern after etching, but it forms in the microstructure of the steel. So the steel has high carbon and it's processed in a certain way by cycling at relatively low temperature to get the carbides to form in these bands. And it's the bands that create these kind of laminated structure that makes a pattern similar to pattern welded Damascus, but in a totally different way. So Juha was interested in the properties of the steel, as a lot of, a lot of us are. Like, you know, is this the true steel of legends? Does it do things that modern steel cannot do? That's one of the questions that Juha wanted to answer. So he, he did an initial study where he just recreated the material. He found that he could recreate it with a chromium addition where Dr. Verhoeven and Al Pendre, famous for their Wootz studies, they found that there was a tiny amount of vanadium in the historical material and that if they added a super tiny amount of vanadium, they could also get very similar structures. So Juha developed this method using chromium and sometimes a small vanadium addition as well. And then he would make comparisons. He found in some of his early tests, they would just like cut through things and see how is the edge holding up. He found that the Wootz could do pretty well, even if it was at a relatively low hardness like the historical blade, somewhere in the mid 40s Rockwell C, compared to a modern blade in a simple carbon steel, which would be more like 60 Rockwell C. Uh, in 2004, he published a more uh, expansive study where they looked at different things. And in that study, he was a little less high on the cutting ability of Wootz. He said if you got the carbide bands directly in the edge, it could perform a lot better than you would think based on the relatively low hardness. But then if the carbides weren't directly in the edge, which is relatively likely, uh, that the properties would not be as good as a modern steel at high hardness. So he gave this ranking of, of various heat treatments where anything that was in 60 plus Rockwell C, it cut really well. But the 40 Rockwell and under stuff just did not cut very well. Then another thing he looked at was toughness. Now I cited this study in my book, Knife Engineering, because I thought it was so interesting and instructive. So he looked at the toughness of Wootz, you know, how tough is this stuff? And he also compared not just the toughness of the Wootz, but also if you gave it a uniform carbide structure like a normal modern steel, how does that compare to the banded structure that gives you the Wootz pattern? And what he found was relatively predictable. If you have a uniform carbide structure, you have higher toughness. Typically, we want to avoid banding because if you've got a band of all these brittle carbides, that gives you a path for crack formation and crack growth. And so the toughness is somewhat reduced. So he found a relatively small but significant improvement in toughness by using a uniform carbide distribution. But typically, people aren't going to do this because the whole point of Wootz is to get the pattern. Then he also compared the toughness of Wootz with modern carbon steels. So he looked at a 1075, that's 0.75% carbon, about half the carbon content of the Wootz that he was making. So that's similar to a 1080 or a 1084 steel. It's called eutectoid, which refers to its carbon content. But he also looked at a 0.29% carbon steel, because typically the lower the carbon, the higher the toughness, which is what he found. The 0.75% carbon steel was significantly tougher than the Wootz with 1.5% carbon, and the 0.3% carbon steel uh, 
was significantly tougher than the 0.75% carbon. So as you reduce carbon, you get less carbide. Again, carbide is a, a brittle particle, and it reduces toughness. And even if your steel has no carbide in it, a lower carbon martensite is typically tougher than a higher carbon martensite when at the same hardness. Uh, the benefit of higher carbon is you can get up to higher hardness. But like if we look at roughly 50 Rockwell C, the 1.5% carbon steel is like 20 or 30 joules in this impact toughness test. The 0.75% carbon steel is like 90. And then the 0.3% carbon steel is almost 200. So like 170-ish. So huge jumps in toughness by reducing the carbon content. And Wootz is not immune to this, even with it being such a legendary material. Then in more recent years, 2015 and 2022, he published a couple articles on the toughness of uh, relatively simple low alloy or carbon steels. And he would use kind of a 1070 or a 1075 as his base composition, similar to the Wootz study. Uh, but in his first study, he looked at the effect of different alloying elements. So one element that's common in steels is vanadium. They add vanadium to pin the grain boundaries and keep the grain size small, even if you overheat the steel somewhat. So he looked at that compared to the base 1070 or 1075. He also looked at nickel. So nickel additions are in like saw steels, like 15 and 20, or in tool steels like L6. And those steels are known for their high toughness. So he wanted to do a comparison on whether or not that nickel really does improve toughness. Another one he looked at was aluminum, which is not that common in tool steels or knife steels, but it is common in a lot of more recent structural steels. And they add the aluminum for a similar reason to vanadium, which is to form fine particles, in this case aluminum nitrides, to pin the grain boundaries. So in his studies, in these recent ones, he actually he treated in a forge, which could be interesting to forging bladesmiths out there about what it means to heat treat with a forge versus a furnace. And so one of the things he discovered was that heat treating in a forge is extremely sensitive to temperature if there are no grain pinning elements. So he was actually really careful in this 2015 study to not overheat the 1070 steel. It's labeled 69C. But even so, the grain still coarsened somewhat and made the toughness worse than the other steels. So this shows just how difficult it can be to avoid grain growth if you have uncontrolled heating in a forge or with a torch or something. And so the toughness of the 69C was lower than the vanadium or the aluminum alloyed steels because even if those were a little overheated, the vanadium or aluminum precipitates would pin the grain boundaries and prevent the grain size from growing. So they had a super fine grain size and significantly better toughness than the 69C. Looking at the nickel alloyed steels, they were lower in hardness. And Juha didn't really propose a hypothesis for this, and I don't know for sure either. But one thing that nickel does is it stabilizes austenite. So you might have heard about retained austenite, where the steel's heated up hot and quenched to form hard martensite, but that austenite at high temperature doesn't all transform. And a little bit is, of it is left over, and that's called retained austenite. So austenite is soft and it reduces your hardness. And this is why cryo treatments are done to try to reduce that. So maybe that's an extra study that could be done if this material still exists to see if that hardness jumps up to the other materials if a cryo step is added. They were also a little lower in carbon, but I don't know if it's enough to explain this significant difference in Rockwell hardness. So given that they were a little softer, you know, the toughness was a little better. It's a little hard to tell if that's truly from a nickel addition or maybe even from the retained austenite. A little bit of retained austenite can boost toughness. Uh, so, yeah, that's maybe a little inconclusive, but it looks like there was a, a small increase in toughness from the nickel. And one of his main points was simply that the vanadium or aluminum addition is very important in forge heat treating just because it's so sensitive to overheating and grain growth. And that was again seen in his more recent study where he looked at ADCRV2. Now, I also published a big ADCRV2 heat treatment article and video several months ago. And uh, he found some very similar things to me, which is very interesting. Uh, like I found that ADCRV2, it's a little sluggish to austenitize at high temperature for those carbides to dissolve because of its small chromium addition. That was a little bit surprising to me just because it's only 0.5% chromium, but when you get it from the manufacturer, it has relatively coarse spheridized carbides, which is a very soft condition, good for machining and things, especially in industry. 
but when you're trying to heat treat in a forge where you can't really do long soak times, it doesn't want to dissolve. And he, he said the same thing. So all of his other experiments he did was from a perlite starting structure or a martensite starting microstructure because those will transform a lot more readily in a forge so you can do a very short soak time. He also found that the conventional advice of heating to non-magnetic and then a shade brighter worked well for ADCRV2 because of that vanadium addition. So the vanadium would prevent grain growth and the chromium would also shift up the peak temperature a little bit. Uh, so following that advice of non-magnetic plus a shade brighter would get you in about the right place without grain growth. But he did find that it's relatively sensitive even then. So four to six seconds, he said, was about right. So heat to non-magnetic, then heat it for another four to six seconds. But when he did eight seconds, there was a little bit of grain growth. And 16 seconds, there was significant grain growth. With 1075 steel with no vanadium in it, uh, only doing one second beyond non-magnetic would lead to a significant increase in the grain size and a significant decrease in the toughness. And he measured this toughness by bending angle rather than impact toughness. So he would take these small fixed specimens and he would bend them until they break. And then he would measure the angle that they were able to bend to before fracture. And you can see generally, you know, the lower you go on hardness, the farther it can bend before fracture as we might expect. You know, a softer steel is more ductile and more tough in general. So the 1075, he said, is not particularly great for heat treating in a forge just because it's so sensitive to overheating, which is similar to things that I found. And he said ADCRV2 is better for heat treating in a forge than 1075. And I agree with that, though I do think that a 1075 plus vanadium would be even more ideal because the chromium does make things a little more sluggish. Using a perlite starting microstructure like normalized steel, meaning you air cooled it instead of slow cooling it to give a perlite microstructure. You can see that in the picture here. Just perlite, the carbide dissolves much more readily. The carbon has to move a much shorter distance than it does with a coarse spheridized microstructure. But with 1075, even with a coarse spheridized microstructure, the dissolution of carbides happens pretty easily because the chromium is not there to slow it down. So carbon is this tiny interstitial element. It diffuses very easily because it can just go in between all of the iron atoms. Where chromium is a substitutional element, iron atoms basically have to move out of the way in this slow process for the chromium to be able to diffuse. Now, using perlite starting microstructure helps a lot with that and solves a lot of that issue. But if we had a 1075 with vanadium, then that would just solve everything. It would be very easy to heat treat even from the manufacturer in a coarse spheridized microstructure, and it would have the vanadium to prevent grain growth. Now, W2 is a pretty similar steel, but it's higher carbon. Again, the higher carbon the steel is, the lower the toughness is. It's more difficult to prevent the steel from being brittle. And also W2 has very low manganese, which makes it more difficult to harden in oil. So uh, this was a fun discussion about Juha. I think he's done some very fun tests. Maybe we'll even be able to get him on on for an interview sometime. Uh, we'll see. Uh, thank you to all my Patreon supporters. Uh, we've got a bunch of supporters now. It's been a really fun community. Every time I post something, I get a lot of comments. So thanks to everyone who's supporting Knife Still Nerds so we can do more experiments and fun things and keep putting out videos just like this one. So thanks, guys. Bye.